Hi folks, so in this video I'm going to talk to you about the category of security vulnerability which is memory management vulnerabilities. So memory management vulnerabilities uh, are vulnerabilities that are related to the way that memory is, is managed. Um, and so the most common kind of memory management vulnerability is a buffer overflow and until recent years buffer overflows were the number one most common security vulnerability. Uh, they result where um, you make a, a programming mistake, usually just using the wrong function or not checking boundaries, and a one-line programming mistake resu can result in a massive uh, critical security vulnerability which will allow an attacker to subvert the behavior of the program. In recent years uh, it's been overtaken by cross-site scripting as the most common uh, but buffer overflows are still plentiful and still discovered regularly. So essentially the reason um, or the, the underlying concept behind these kinds of vulnerabilities is that you have all the software on your computer is responsible for managing the memory. So it's kind of a combination of what happens in the user application, so a program that you're running, and that program has to ask the kernel for some, some memory. The kernel says, okay, here's some memory that you can use, so some RAM that you uh, can store within, uh, and the protections within an operating system will mean that there will be a virtual address space used so that each program gets its own kind of section of RAM that it's allowed to use. Uh, but that program has to ask if it wants a bit more, uh, and then it gets allocated onto the heap, for example and it'll have some memory that's on the stack and and then it has to kind of manage and, and use that stuff and there are some programming languages that kind of help the program along so if you use something like Java for example built into the language are protections that stop you from accessing things accidentally and doing things that don't make sense whereas the hardware of the computer itself so like the actual CPU does not restrict you in that way. And so if you're writing in a programming language that is closer to what the assembly is or the, the machine code is that runs on your computer. So for example, if you're writing in C or C++, they're built into the language itself and not protections against doing things that don't actually make much sense. So you could write a C program and just, you can access any memory address that you like. You can, you just, you can do that. You can write some code that, uh, tries to access a memory address and get something out of it. Um, if that memory address um, hasn't even been allocated yet, your program's going to crash. Um, and there's also not protections against doing things like um, copying into the wrong variable or copying more than what fits into a variable. All those sorts of things, a lot of it is left to the, for the, to the developer to do and to write their code really carefully, essentially, so they don't come into these problems. Um, usually, if you're lucky, what happens is you're testing your code and your program crashes and then you realize I've made a mistake and you fix it. Um, but a lot of the time the mistakes can be quite subtle uh, and attackers will try things that the software developers don't mean to and, and discover that there are these kinds of um, vulnerabilities within the software. Um, so yeah, a lot of them are to do with bounds checking. So. Um, buffer overflows in particular are often where you have what's known as a spatial vulnerability. So, you know, you're, you've are you got a variable, you've got access to it, and you start writing into it, and you basically, you've got an index that you're writing into, uh, but you write too far. So you've got a variable, and you start feeding information into it, and it just lets you keep writing more and more and more into it until you're writing into the wrong part of memory entirely. Um, and so that's an example of a spatial vulnerability. A temporal vulnerability is where um, is like a timing issue. So the memory may have been allocated at some point, but since then it's been deallocated or it's been reallocated to something else, some other purpose. Um, and so by accessing that, you can you know get un, um, unexpected behaviour. So there, uh, you can kind of categorise the kinds of attacks with memory management vulnerabilities in a few ways. So you have code corruption attack where you're modifying the program code, so the actual code of a program that's running. Um, 
you've got the more common control flow hijack attack, which is where you manage to overwrite a, a pointer within the code with something. So a pointer is um, like in in C is basically a memory address, and so often you've got in memory you've got an address to somewhere else in memory, and so if you can overwrite a pointer to somewhere else, so it points somewhere else. Uh, you can get it to jump either to your own code. So for example, as an attacker, if you put something into a buffer and then you manage to point a pointer, like the return pointer, um, in back at your own shell code, um, then you can basically get it to run your code. Or you can reuse existing code with um, what's sometimes known as arc injection attacks or return to libc or, or rop um, return oriented programming where you basically do some clever stuff to reuse the code that's already in memory uh, to make it do um, things that the developer didn't expect. So you, you're either way you're changing the control flow that's happening through the program. There are data only attacks and that's kind of the most simple version of buffer overflow where you just overwrite another variable um, and not necessarily over pointers, um, which can change the behavior of the software, um, which can obviously have security consequences, or information leak attacks where you read the contents of memory. Uh, and so if you can read the contents of memory, you might find things like passwords or uh, encryption like keys um, and all, all sorts of other you know things that you're not supposed to have access to. Uh, and you know one of the uh, well-known vulnerabilities from a few year, years ago is the heart bleed, which was an uh, information leak attack and obviously had huge consequences. So how do we prevent memory management vulnerabilities? So it's through a few things. We can use coding practices to, while well, we're writing our software, to be careful to, to do certain things. And I'll talk about that in a second. There are language platform defenses and we can use type safety which is essentially things that we build into the way that we write our code or the platforms that we're writing our code onto that helps to protect our code to make sure it doesn't like read out of bounds for example and then there are operating system and kernel mitigations as well which I'll mention but we'll go into uh, in another video later. So when you're programming there's a number of functions that are now considered to be dangerous. So you should, if you're writing C for example, you should never use str copy, um, string copy, use string and copy instead, which is where you specify the length of the string that you're copying. Don't use str cat, use str and cat. Again, one where you specify the length. Don't use gets, uh, get string. Instead use f get s or um, gets underscore s. So those, the main differences between those functions is that you can specify how long you expect the buffer to be so that it doesn't just continue on and copy stuff into adjacent memory. So it just copies the what will actually fit in the buffer that you have in memory. So even if you're using those you need to be careful and so for example you have to watch out because you um, when you're programming in C you always need to include one extra character for the null byte at the end that says it's the end of the string so there's often there's quite a few um, functions that if you're not paying attention to the manual for how you use them you might miss that and then you might end up writing your null character actually onto the next variable or the next adjacent piece of space which, um, space, which can still cause problems so there's, you know you have to be really careful. Uh, so the, there's advantages to using the heap instead of always putting everything on the stack as well partly because heap based buffer overflows are a bit more complicated but it just keeps things a bit cleaner as well so rather than statically creating all your variables um, like, like this for example um, you can actually uh, basically declare the, that you want to have a string and then you can allocate some memory uh, when you need it um, and then remember to free that memory afterwards um, and it's also good because uh, obviously the stack can only be a certain size. So if you need lots of space for that um, variable, then uh, you know that can be helpful uh, to be able to ask for more memory from heap than you could put on the stack without causing problems. So 
you always need to check that the allocation succeeded, that you have actually got memory, and you should never try and access heap memory unless you know it was allocated successfully. So, in general, with defensive programming, you always want to assume the worst. Don't make assumptions of success. So if you call a function, a lot of function library calls will return back a value that tells you whether it succeeded. But you'll also see a lot of code snippets, for example, on Stack Overflow, where they don't check the return value. They just call um, the, the thing and assume it succeeded and continue on to do other things. Well, that is often um, can result in security vulnerabilities. So, you know, you need to be careful of that. So always be defensive in how you're programming. There are mitigations that built into the operating system kernel that you can use that makes things more difficult. So you can use address space layout randomization, ASLR. You can use stack canaries, which kind of try and detect buffer overflows onto the stack. You can use non-executable um, stacks and memory regions and things. So there's a whole bunch of um, technologies. We'll talk about them in separate videos. Um, and they do make things more difficult, So, which is why when we're starting off learning about buffer overflows, we turn a lot of that stuff off because it's easier to understand and learn the concepts without those things on. And then we can start to turn them on and understand how you can uh, actually still succeed in um, causing buffer overflows even in the presence of this stuff. So you can still be clever to circumvent a lot of these things. So really, defensive programming is a necessity. So you should... If you're writing code in C or C++, or you're auditing someone else's code, it's really important that it's being very defensively coded and really careful about how it manages and uses memory. Um, and, you know, or use a programming language where the framework, it has code within the framework and the way that the, pro the compiled program runs. So for example, the Java Virtual Machine will and do garbage collection and do the freeing and, and um, of memory for you and sort of take some of that responsibility away from the programmer. But either way, you have to be um, careful of these things. So uh, that's the end of this video, and I'll continue with some of the gory details of buffer overflows in another video.